Afterwards, that the data was a answer, but <laughs> you're included, and it was recorded. Is it just so amazing that we can literally whisper words, and uh, we have a global audience? You see, Jesus is the desire of the nations. <sighs> he has no competition. And the simplicity of the gospel is just the most attractive, most powerful, most irresistible influence in the world. <coughs> there is no life that you can imagine to live that can match the adventure of God finding face, feet, hands, and voice in ordinary you. <laughs> There's nothing so ordinary about you when you discover yourself located in the very heartbeat of God. We used to think that faith had something to do with us trying to focus on God. You know, concentrate on God. Until you discover that He is mindful of you. You know that God cannot get you out of His mind. It's the most wonderful therapy to wake up at any odd hour of the night. And just remind yourself. I'm the focus of his attention. You don't have to say, Hello, God, here I am. You can do that. It makes you feel this bump of bloody nose. You are found. There's no definition of lostness that can somehow wipe us off the map. And God says, Where did that one go? <laughs> You're found in Him. You're found in Him. And we celebrated this morning's session just as an introduction to hear our precious brother John highlight the gospel in John 14, verse 20. In that day you will know. And it's in that knowing that you discover yourself. But as I, Jesus, am in the Father, so you are in me and I am in you. And in that embrace, we find ourselves. We discover our true identity. Now, we did get a bit sidetracked this morning like we normally do, but we, now we've got a, a, a bigger book to, to get lost in. You know, so, but but we, were, we were on to Brother Simon and his first encounter with Jesus, remember? And yet, Simon encounters the Word. And the word lifts him, lifts his thinking into another dimension. I mean, he's had routine thinking tattooed in his memory. You can imagine growing up uh, as a partner of the two boys whose father was called the Thunder. Yeah. Sons of the Thunder. I mean, this man had them in their routine. They knew exactly how to fold their nets and what hour to go and how to do it. You don't teach a fisherman. That. I, I remember coming down here to the, um, my eldest brother, Leon, your opa. He's, he married this, this, an Italian as well. So he would come down. We always would go to a and So he would come down and say, we started catching shad. But we realized you don't catch shad the way we catch Hayun in Hermanus. It's funny. We fall down the tricks for the for eight of this <laughs> oh, thank God for the Indian Ocean. <laughs> so Simon, he knew what he was taught. And it became his reference and his frame of therapy. And suddenly he hears a word from a new rabbi in town, Carpenter. And like those two on their way to Imaos, met the stranger <coughs> and when they reflected on their encounter they said that not their hearts burn within us you see you are absolutely designed to be totally compatible yes. to the voice of the shepherd if something stirs and ignites in your heart on a level that just takes you beyond the old way of thinking Yes, John, Isaiah 40, we'll get back to Isaiah 40, you're the young men, you know, in their athletic strength, rich and then the limit, whether they come weary and exhausted, but they that wait upon the Lord to use their strength. And I love the, 
the Hebrew word there for waiting upon the Lord, because we've made waiting upon the Lord all kinds of stuff. And we've sold the recipes. But he says, they that, bound, that they that wait upon the Lord, bound up with strength, bound up with wings like an eagle, he increases their strength, he multiplies their, he quickens their entire being, they discover themselves in another dimension. They're mounting up with wings like an eagle, like an eagle, not like a duck, you know, trying to just stay airborne. Right. You know, but just yeah. like an eagle. And now they do the stuff that they did yesterday, they totally exhausted them. They run and they're not weary. They walk and they don't faint. You see, the word desires to bring us into a place of understanding our compatibility with the word. Becoming absolutely, our patterns become spoiled in the positive sense of the word. But also, we are not going to know better. We incline our ear. You see, the Hebrew word to wait is the word kavar. Yes, sir, that's the Hebrew word to know. Kavar. And the word kavar means to entwine it. He multiplies strength. How does he do it? By twining. Now, when, to go back to the fishing idea, we know when we go fishing that you want to catch some 90 pound or what. But you, you've got to have a breaking strength mind. You call it breaking strength because you, 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 you anticipate a certain size monster fish, you know. <laughs> so you, you, you have to have a tackle. So the, that line is, 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 is compatible. And God has so wired our minds to entwine. Waiting is boring, but entwining is exciting. Yes, your baby will be your good dog. You can't go. And we're just going to be, you know, you've got to do the religious thing, read some Bible and pray and go through the routine and hallelujah, you're going to be. But entwining. I thank God for the year. <laughs> we met in 1974 when I was with Youth for Christ for a year, Y1. And um, we were working in the Pioneer to Y Youth for Christ in Namibia. So I was working in Wolfish Bay at that time with a team. And we would start coffee bars. It was the thing then, you know, you do coffee bars and then you do music and invite people. And, we go to the churches and the schools. It was a great fun. I had a fantastic year. And really, it was the year after my army. And I didn't know what to do with my life. So I just thought, oh, I met this guy from Youth of Christ. The army. I said, what do you do? She's not come. So I went to Youth of Christ. There we go. <sighs> and then um, we the day at Margate. We went down for 10 days. All the teams came together. And we were off to Wolfish Bay again. From the uttermost parts of the earth it was. And Wolf is buying that Margate. It's fair. Then he died. Then he loved it. That was really worth my while. <laughs> and um, I was always a really lazy reader. I still am. I don't just read books. I get so tired. I get bored, you know, I read books. I just read and write. So, but I, I had my, my, my brother Leon. He consumed books. Leon would, would and, and him and my mother, my mother had a Christian bookshop. They could read the book by just glancing at it. They had just amazing capacity to read. I read every word, and I've forgotten I could have read it again. So I struggled with my essays at school. It was really, to me, when I get an essay, I don't know where I'm going to get the time from. I'd much rather go play some cricket or rugby or do something outdoors, but studying was a struggle. But thank God for an older brother, you know, for him reading all these books. Essays just came automatic. So, for a small bribe or just out of his love, he would just do what needed to happen. I would get my essay sorted, you know, my, <laughs> my, my cousin, my cousin Ethelbert Smith, he's in Havana's as well. He was very good at German. And I, I had German as well at school, so, <laughs> so he would, I, 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 I literally, I uh, memorized three of his essays off by heart and got me through the trick. <laughs> the, the, the themes didn't always fit, but the grammar was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so I just squeezed it in, I'll get the grammar, I 
straight through. But the point I want to make, when I fell in love with Lydia, now I'm in Belfast by a teasing market. And it's, yeah, it's years before um, cell phones and Twitter and tweets and stuff. It's not just on the telephone, you know, there's winding up telephones. You speak to an exchange. And I'm a missionary in Malfish Bay, no money. So I thought, I'm just a girl, I want to talk to her. And she said, I'm just going to say, she said, I'm just going to say, she said, I'm going to speak to the right one. So I speak to the exchange. I said, listen, I'm explaining my story and I want his heart to. And I would have thought I had to win hearts. I mean, I mean, I mean. I said, I've got this girlfriend in called Shepsi, but I've got no money, man. Is it possible just to ring? I, I won't talk, I just want to hear her voice. <laughs> and you know, in those days, I would go and buy a little scrapbook, you know, those writing pads. And when I could not write a sentence at school, because I was just too lazy to think that in, suddenly I'm starting to write volumes after volumes, you know, this, 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 this doesn't stop. You run out of pages and you read it again and again and again and verpakkom en al die sweeties en spuit het met die perfeem en het hele gat en dan is die oude daar, you know, it's 1974 and then, you know, events for you that day to go get there but in the meantime there are a few more will follow and there will be follow-ups and driving from where we stayed, I always had to go by the post office just to go check if there's not a letter back. And when we get these letters, man, I tell you, yeah, right, and, 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 and you don't think, oh, well, okay, I'll keep this in, I'll read this, and then maybe next week when I get a chance. The whole thing is now engaged because this writing represents a very real person, not some philosophy fantasy that we've imagined we this is we did not follow cleverly devised and we were eyewitnesses of these matches. And it so stirred my being to read the Bible differently. Say if this book was not written to bore us, but if it carries the heart of God. If it's the desire of the creator of the universe to unveil the mystery that was hidden for ages and generations. How can we try and package that in name and doctrines and ideas and philosophies and exchange that for the real deal? I thank God for your pain. And the Bible says, He loved us first. You see, God didn't do what He did in Jesus because He felt obliged, you know, and well, He just do the, the right thing. Of God's doing, are you in Christ? See, if that settles in your heart, it changes everything. My in Christness is not the result of some theological debate. Jesus never came to this planet to win a few doctrinal debates. He came to win our hearts. So we discover ourselves in Him, in that picture there. And him and us, we realize there's a, there's a seamlessness about this. So what happens to the struggle that we were told, you know, we've got to pursue and strive and do? You know, they that cover, they that cover, entwine, thought, the thought. They mount up with things like an evil. They run and they don't, they're not weary. You see, only get two zeals. The Bible speaks of two kinds of zeals. A zeal for God and the zeal of the Lord. The one exhausts, the other one ignites. Don't get confused. Religion is just the most exhausting, bonero system. It's full of labor and, and struggle and annoyance. And <laughs> but then hearts ignite. This happened to Simon. You know, his ear is 
He was so tired, toiled all night, has nothing to show for it. And here he is, this man, teach, speak a word that awakens his heart and suddenly stops yawning, stops desiring to just get back home and just, just get this night over with. He just suddenly finds new perspective. Now it's with the wings. The next minute, he's got to call his partners and he says, this, this catch is bigger than what we anticipated. You know the saddest thing about that story? Is how religion kicks back in again. You see, Simon and his buddies grew up in a religion which is almost like karma, you know? You pay now, and uh, you sit now, pay later, or pay now, sit later, but I mean the whole thing's going to be balanced out somehow. So, you've already figured out and calculated the fact that we didn't catch anything last night. I mean, you can imagine a Pumaka Dobho in the boat. Because they must be sitting in the camp. Because we're in Deuteronomy... Uh, let me tell you, Deuteronomy 28 is outdated. So stop chasing blessings, not playing light, snakes and ladders. Oh, a green card. If I could just get a ladder and get a bit of an elevator. Oh, hallelujah, this... You know, and in the next minute, I'll oh, slip his tongue over here. There you go. Well, you guys, you us and you stay in this treadmill of constantly striving to get a little bit of a breakthrough, a little bit lifted up. And you are seated together. You begin at the finish. So Simon already worked this one out, and he says, "Well, I'll live with this. You know, we will have to live with this. Whoever it was, it's now guilty enough." Why we didn't catch any fish, you know, God's obviously punishing us because we didn't have clean enough lives. It's like in that lake of, oh, and you this sweet spot, clean life. <laughs> or we listen to our favorite, is it, um, what's the one? Julie Andrews. Julie Andrews. For somewhere in my youth, or child, I must have done something wrong. It's like always time to make the equation. That is the fruit of the wrong tree. Oh, you guys really deserve this. You know, we're so thankful for you. You really deserve this. Go for it. So Peter made Simon made the equation that well, we we paid, we paid us, we we toiled, and our toil was our currency. We exchanged our toil for last week's sins. Obviously. So that makes us uh, feeling more positive about tomorrow's chances. Yeah. <laughs> because last night we took nothing, tomorrow night, yay, then the gods are going to smile on us again. The gods must be crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so tomorrow we're going to make up, we're going to make up. And yet Jesus shocks him against the grain of his expectation. His, his boat's about to sink. His nets are about to... You see, I love Ephesians 3.20. Paul goes into this language where he exaggerates because he knows you cannot exaggerate this stuff. This is exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you can ask or imagine. Don't dwarf your dreams into, oh, I need this or I need that. Forget about it. You never need to ask God for your daily bread again. Here's what you're asking for. Lord, give me the nations. And I will give the ends of the earth as your inheritance. God's appetite is ah. always for people. It's the largest life you could live. Isn't it? And can make plan, okay, and then, you know, as for it no more. <laughs> Ask me for the nations. Paul greets his friends in Romans 16 and he mentions the guy, Epinetus. You never hear of Epinetus. Paul says, embrace Epinetus. He was my first fruit in Asia. He saw an entire continent in one man. When you begin to see your life, people differently. Adventure happens. Adventure happens. In the next person you come to. Thank God for pulpits. And this is just for practical reasons. It's wonderful. And occasions like this. But the pulpit doesn't stay here. You're the pulpit. Yes. Yeah. The living epistle. Known and read by all. Yes. Paul goes as global. I almost said universal. But then you get... Ah. But Paul went as global as you can imagine. He says, you're 
directed by God, by His Spirit. Not because you're trying to, man, how many of you are trying to memorize this guy's speech speech? No, 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 forget about memorizing speeches. Encounter the Word. Yes. Yeah. And at your Word you go. Yes. And at your Word you go. And out of that going, I suddenly discovered, hey, I can fly. Yeah. 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 <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, up. Yeah. There's a dimension that you are designing to fall. The supernatural is not some spooky place that you could have go through. Oh. I've prayed up enough here. Yeah. I think here Jesus goes to deliver a man of a legion of demons. Can you imagine the capacity of one person? A legion of demonic stuff. And he's in a boat, in a storm, fast asleep. You think, Jesus, at least you've got to pray up a bit. Oh, God, I'll shed that. March the march the deck because you've got to face it. And then he's fast asleep. Sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is to go to sleep. It doesn't mean that he didn't sometimes stay up all night. But it wasn't some kind of rule of being off an arm, but it was my A long half session. Some encounter. Supernatural in the very natural environment of the marketplace of his life. But then he shocks us all. You know what he says to Jesus? He didn't say, Jesus, this is fantastic. I mean, we could not have dreamt to have such a massive catch. This completely puts last night's struggle you know, out of the equation. This, this is it. What are you doing tonight? Don't you want to sign up and become a partner? I mean, we can make some serious money here. Jesus, come on, join the party. You know what Simon says? Depart from me, Lord, for I'm a sinful man. You see, sin consciousness is the currency of religion. And no other religion exploited it more than the Christian religion. That's why Luther did what he did. Because those massive buildings were all built with guilt money. Got to buy favor again, indulgences. Oh, get, get, get some loved one that died somewhere along the line. Get, just buy out some time out of the purgatory that they're suffering. What lies we've believed. And God says, in a sense, I have no thought of it. I'm not going to waste a thought on it either. Don't get like the other brother, you know. When the brother returns, his father pleads with him. I love the way the father pleads with the other brother. Mm. I was telling Pastor Evero yesterday when we were flying from San Francisco to Subway in Texas and sitting with my laptop translating 1 Corinthians 5, uh, 5 in verse 19 where, where God was in Christ when He reconciled the world to Himself. Do you know that the world is already reconciled? Yes. Do you mean that all people are saved? Yes, I do. <laughs> Every single there's not one unsaved person in the universe. <laughs> the problem is most people alive today don't know it. Yes. So you know what God does? Really, one two Corinthians five. He pleads from within us. Yes. With an already yes. reconciled world. Not become reconciled. He says, be ye reconciled. So I thought while I'm doing this, and listening, and I said, I'm sure this word, this, this pleading is repeated in Luke for the same word. And it's the word for my letters, by the way. So, uh, so there I did Luke, father pleading with the other brother. And we arrive in, in Austin. We come from Austin, and there's an Austin and a Houston there in Texas. So we meet this lovely brother, Danny Randall, I think it was. I know Danny, if you were on Facebook. And he has this lovely tattoo on his arm. Now he's got the arm for it. My arms are different. He's got this like a first arm. So it's written in Greek. That very sentence. And he says he sits in the pub and everybody wants to know. So what's that saying on your arm? Yeah. You know what he says? My son, you have always been with me. Yes. And all that I have is yours. <laughs> that sounds like gospel. Yeah, yeah. And you know what we see? The other brother is beginning to tap his feet yes. because of the irresistible, attractive sound, the festive sound of the body. <laughs> You're invited <laughs> to participate in the most amazing party. So, 
Simon discovered that day, briefly, that there is a dimension that has got absolutely nothing to do with my performance. Yes. Or depart from me from a sinful man. <laughs> As if your being not so sinful qualifies you more for the reward, for, for, for the gift. Because while in reward mindset, language contradicts the gift. I know I've told this story many times, but maybe I can sneak it in now. I always think of, of my brother-in-law when I tell the story, so I'm just naming the story. It's about a little Ishiyan, Ishiyan, who grows up very poor, and uh, you know, it's, it's towards Christmas season, and he, he goes to his daddy, and he says, Daddy, you know, all my friends have BMX bicycles, and uh, <coughs> can you please, for this Christmas, buy me a BMX bicycle? He says, yes, buddy, you know that, or it's impossible. You know, we cannot do it, but yes, a good plan. He says, you go to your bedroom, write baby Jesus a letter, and explain to Jesus. Baby Jesus, or many, we do not think. So she runs off to his bedroom and writes, I dear baby Jesus, my name is Giovanni, I'm from the poor family, da 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 the whole story. He says, I promise I'll be good for one year. If you give me a next bicycle this Christmas, he reads it, he tears it out, he says, it's not going to work. <laughs> he says, oh, okay, start again. Hey, dear baby Jesus, it's me, she's running again. Um, uh, I, I promise I'm good for one month. You give me one <laughs> So he's down to a week, and he realizes, this is not going to work. <laughs> and now starts writing, he says, dear baby Jesus, I promise I'll be good for one whole day. Can you give me a damage bicycle for this Christmas? He's totally like, he's like, in tears, this is not going to work. You'll never see that damage bicycle. <laughs> And he walks to the house, totally disappointed. Until he gets a plan. He walks into the living room, and there on the piano is a statue of Mother Mary. He thinks there's nobody watching him. He grabs the statue under his arm, off to his bedroom, with the bottom drawer, all the undies and the socks out, put the statue away, put it all back, close it when he starts writing with a different attitude this time. He says, uh, uh, dear baby Jesus, uh, you want to see your mother <laughs> Depart from a Lord, from a sinful man. There's no ways I'm going to make this equation. Now, I'm not saying that to give you a cheap excuse to live an inferior life. On the contrary, your design is the Father's desire. And now with unveiled faces, gazing upon the glory of the Lord as in a manner. The mystery that was hidden for ages and generations is now reflected in ordinary human life. Sometimes we get so attracted to the spectacular that we miss out on the ordinary. And, 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 and in a way, you know, we've, 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 we've become addicted to the spectacular, typical Hollywood display of church and Christianity. Yes. And if your situation doesn't match theirs, then sorry, you're out. <laughs> the most spectacular life you could live is within the simplicity of a seamless oneness. A seamless oneness that engages in the cabal encounter. Just your thoughts. Your thoughts. My thoughts. Isaiah 55. Unfortunately, we've kind of boxed in verse 8 and 9 into a separate doctrine. God says, your thoughts are not my thoughts. Therefore, your ways are not my ways. Yeah. And then he goes, the next verse, the next verse makes it almost worse. It says, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my thoughts higher than your thoughts? I've got a whole thing, I think, on, on the chapter, uh, the notes from Armageddon, I speak about the, uh, 
this earth bound and heavenly bound, <laughs> but to get back to Isaiah 55. Is heaven higher than the earth? So are my thoughts higher than your thoughts? And my ways higher than your ways. Mm -hmm. And then he closed the book and think, well, that's it, you know. God does what God does. So it's become a famous or favorite quote during the funerals, you know. No, God's thoughts are not our thoughts. And his ways are not our ways. But the good news is in the next verse. And in there. Now they've got the picture of the distance between heaven and earth. And suddenly, he breaks into that picture. He says, but as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, to do what? To cancel the distance. And what's its mission? To saturate the soil. Do you know the soil is human flesh? Every nook and cranny of it is impressed in the world that became flesh. In a body exactly like ours. Jesus did not arrive on the planet in a Superman suit. In a body exactly like ours. To prove that our design is not inferior to God's dream. <laughs> you are God's dream girl. In the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, you shine as lights. Arise and shine for your light is come. And the glory of the Lord shall be seen upon you. And the nations shall come to your light. And their kings to the brightness of your eyes. Stop allowing the politics and the economy of the day to dictate yeah. your joy, <laughs> your future. You are defined in Christ. You are defined in Him. And He has come to unveil you. So we said earlier on this morning that in Matthew 16, Jesus is about to introduce Simon to Peter. All along he's only known himself as Simon. But my brother Simon, I've got news for you. I would like to introduce you to you. But the old ugly duckling mindset is no longer relevant to beauty for you. Peter. So Jesus asks in Matthew 16, from verse 13 onwards, He asks the most important question in the Bible. He says, Who do people say that I, the Son of Man, am? I always have to think to get my hands and arms right because I'm off the front. Who do people say that I, the Son of Man, am? That is the universal question of the human race. Who am I? And Jesus came to answer that. Yes. Because we've lost our sense of identity. In, in the form of our yes. mindsets. We've lost our sense of belonging. Our sense of innocence. A sense of royalty. We've lost that. And Jesus came not only to reveal that in his person, but to redeem that in the human person. The circles main spheres. But that was going for Ross. You can say, oh, no, sorry, man. That was an old model, you know. We've got to upgrade this thing now. We've got to redo something because that means we'll just scrap it. No, no. He came to redeem the original you. When Paul says, I no longer live, he speaks about it, but he's quickly read it to you. I've updated maybe 150 texts as well in this new edition. And, uh, what does Paul say that again? Galatians 2 class. Galatians 2 20. The bars of bars, he has always three faces. There we go. And Paul says, yeah, so beautifully, he says, um, so here I am, dead and alive at the same time. I'm dead to the old me I was trying to be. 
and alive to the real me, which is Christ in me. Co-crucified. Now co-alive. What a glorious entanglement. I was in him in his death. Now I'm in now he's in me in my life. For the first time I'm free to be me in my skin. Immersed in his faith, in our joint sonship. He loves me and believes in me. He is God's gift to me. He believes in me. So Jesus asked, Who do people say that I the Son of Man am? And by that time, in his life became very um, much the gossip of the moment. You know, everyone had their opinion. Because suddenly, this carpenter's son, he does amazing things and says amazing things. And so they come out with the idea that maybe this is some kind of reincarnation that's happened here. Maybe Elijah, the prophet, because certainly they. They see there's some prophetic element, some prophetic fulfillment. And Elijah represents the prophetic of Israel. He's found flesh again. Maybe it's Elijah that returned. So Jesus says, but in your opinion, speaking to his disciples, who do you say that I, the Son of Man, am? What is the question? Who is the Son of Man? And Simon, the fisherman. We had that encounter in the boat, remember? And then he was told, get behind me, Diabolos. Diabolos, there was somebody that the fallen mind, Dia, because of Balo, to cast down, the cast down thinking. He says, Simon says, uh, Jesus. And he's not trying out, could this possibly be the correct answer? I I'll, just, I'll just be bold and say it. <laughs> By revelation, when revelation strikes your spirit, you don't have to go and argue about it on Facebook. <laughs> don't start debates. Avoid debates. He gets it by revelation. He says, Jesus, you're the Messiah. You're the one the prophets spoke about. You're what the entire scripture is all about. You're the Christ. You are the Son of God. What was the question? Who is the Son of Man? What is the answer? The Son of Man is the Son of God. No, you did not begin in your mother's womb. You began in God. You are the Son of God. And you know what Jesus says? Yes, your theological certificate. That was a good answer. <laughs> Simon, now that you know who I am, would you allow me to introduce you to you? Blessed are you. Simon, and notice what he calls him. He speaks Aramaic. He says, Bar Jonah. Bar means son. Jonah. Jonah means dove. In the song of songs, there's such a beautiful reflection on your life. Oh my dove, in the cleft of the rocks, let me hear your voice, let me see your face. For your voice is sweet, and your face is beautiful. Blessed are you, Simon, the son of Jonah. Flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. You see, the revelation of your such is not a flesh and blood thing. I must just, before I carry on, they just read John 1 13 quickly. You'll enjoy John 1 12 as well. John 1 13. These are the ones who discover their genesis in God beyond their natural conception. This is not about our blood lineage or whether we were a wanted or unwanted child. This is about our God begottenness. I just ponder that for a moment. Thank you, Lord. It's wonderful to um, just enjoy the, the 
emotion of that, of your God. So I struggle sometimes with tears, but I never knew it. You were my I so desire for this reason. She might have heard it before. But to fall fresh and new like the morning dew. Awaken your hearts. There's no hardness of heart that can resist the ruling of God. God feels romantic about you. There's so much more in mind for you than the daily routine of just another day on the planet. He wants to awaken the, the adventure of faith. Of what faith sees. Yes, Abraham saw my day. But before Abraham was, I am. So he says you, John 1 13. It's not about whether you're a wanted or a wanted child. It's about our God begotten us. We are his dream come true. And not the invention of our parents. You're indeed the greatest idea that God has ever had. And I don't intend to read the rest of that. So you read the But Matthew 13, Jesus says to the rest of the Simon, son of Jonah. And he calls him by his, what we say in English, his surname, Bar Jonah, is like you, son of, I'm a Dutoi, Dutoi, son of, some answer. So this, but it's not about the patronage. Paul discovers this in Galatians chapter 1. He says that God was pleased to separate me from my mother's womb. He says, I have so much um, uh, breeding, you know, in the context of the Jewish. Genealogies, you know, I can trace my, my great 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 ancestors back to Benjamin. Come on, maybe you were just the son of Leah, you know, but I'm with Rachel, the favorite one. Oh, I'm separated from my mother's womb. I've discovered my identity not in my blood and age, but in my God begottenness. You are begotten of God. How South Africa and the world needs to hear this message. Yes. We've so reduced our societies into all kinds of groupings, you know, clans and ethnic stuff and geographic stuff and language stuff. But there is only one Father. And there is only one faith. How can a father of lies compete with the only true father? The legitimacy of sonship is redeemed in the Son of God. So who do men say that I, the son of man, am? Mr. Simon, allow me to introduce you to Petros. And upon this Petra, I will build my Ecclesia. Now I've got a study this. In the Greek, the word Petros speaks of a little pebble, a little stone. I call it the chip of the old block. Because Petra is the big rock. So, Mr. Simon, let me introduce you to you. Mr. Rock, you are a chip of the old block. And upon this block will I build my Ecclesia. And the gates of Hades shall not prevail against you. Against you. made sure that I will never ever forget 1 Kings 6 7 because at that time it was in 1978 I was there uh, asked not to carry on with my studies under the theological banner and uh, so I joined Youth of the Mission 1978 and um, we had a, a pattern of reading and actually for a few years I did that. I would read two, two chapters, Old Testament. Once a year you work for the Old Testament. You take Psalms out, 
you've got to do five songs a day, then you've got to do it once a month. The next month you just do progress because it's 30 more progress, so you do it one day. And then the rest of the book you divide it into, and twice a year you work for the Old Testament. But at the same time you read two chapters out in, uh, in the New Testament. And so three times a year you're through the New Testament. So we did that for a few years. And Holy Spirit knew how to get my attention because now I came back from Argentina and oh, no, I'm not going to know all the details, but anyway. Um, I start getting all kinds of funny thoughts that, you know, maybe I should just be up now being with Lydia for four years, we are very good friends, but I'm living on, on this mission. And I'll, I, I, what I'll do is I'll just want to marry. I'll just be like Paul. Now I've got to go back to South Africa and tell Lydia that, listen, God told me that I should be out of way. We've got a lot of things under the desk, so yeah, the Lord. <laughs> You're on your own. <laughs> like this guy was prophesying way back, he says, oh, perilous times are coming, say the Lord, dark days are coming, even I'm scared, say the Lord. <laughs> so I had this idea that maybe I should know, and I just couldn't do it, but I'm going to go and tell my, my, my life, my wife, my love, that I'm going to help them and not to marry. Yeah, wife to be. Yeah, for sure. I've been my, my, my life. <laughs> and so that morning I'm just doing my reading and I'm there's not all in October. So I'm in, in one Kings. Please remind me of these things that you do. Oh, this Yona, this Yona. Okay, so I listen to Yona. So um, <coughs> I'm reading this stuff, 1 Kings 6. And the first line says, in the fourth year, the second month, the foundation of the temple was done. And like that, I knew it before I looked at it. I thought, four years and two months, and I backdated 25 of August 1974. It was exactly the first day of the second month, the fourth year that I met Lydia. And Holy Spirit had my attention, obviously. I mean, I wrote a letter to her, and just altered it. It was just because here you know, I am preparing myself to try and tell her this is it. And God says, this is it. <laughs> and guess what? Guess what? The next, when I'll get back to 1 Kings 6, because it's very important. The next chapter that I was reading was second, 1 Peter chapter 2. But wait, I've got to read verse 7 of, of the temple. 1 Kings 6 verse 7. It says, the day that the temple was built, it was built with stone that was cut to perfection in the quarry. So much so that there was not even a sound of a hammer or a chisel. Yeah, wow. yeah, yeah. But in our days, I mean, we built like Thomas here when we plaster over it. That's all the people just took place there. Every stone was perfectly by precision cut. Massive stones in the quarry. And here I am in a ministry, and I've got to now think this thing through. And I said, What is the quarry then? Because we've allowed in our doctrines all kinds of ideas about the quarry. It could be the wife you marry, you know. <laughs> because we're not going to be the director of No, God, you know, you'll sort out one another so that eventually yeah. you'll maybe qualify to go to heaven one day. Yeah. And we've taught those lies and written yeah. libraries full of books of junk. The quarry is the cross. It's not the bus you have to endure. You hate your work and you hate this, but it's God's trying to build character. That's nonsense. Character is the mark of the beast, the mark, the mark of the head and the hand. It's, it's the imprint of a wrong mindset, of the currency of Poneros, labor, hardships, annoyances that I've got to No, no, no. You've got to precision in the cross. He says it is finished at this time. Not a sound of a hammer. Chisel. That dumps most of our doctrines. Like 99% of it. Of, you know, I'm under construction. God's not finished with me yet. You know. And so we just go for another lap through the same old wilderness. 40 years, a lifetime wasted in a wrong belief system. But we've heard how your God delivered you from Pharaoh. And how we've preached to defeat the devil back into business. Yeah. And we've sold our ideas around imperfection. And you, you're just going to, God's just going to continue to have to chisel onto you. Come on. Look into the mirror of the Word. Yeah. 
See there the face of your birth. <laughs> James chapter 1, the brother of Jesus. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul writes it so beautifully. He says, after the resurrection of Jesus, he appeared to many eyewitnesses. And he mentions a few individuals. And, and then he says at one time, even to more than 500, and most of them are still alive at the time of writing. And then he also appeared to James. And here one of the brothers who did not believe in Jesus, John tells us. He sees Jesus in a brand new light. And now he writes in James chapter 1, he says, huh? Every good and perfect gift. Now you try and find flaw in good, perfect and gift. Every good, perfect gift, other thing, uses exactly the same word that John uses in John chapter 3. No, John did not say that, you quoting Jesus, you must be born again. He never used that word. He says, unless you are a new thing, born from above, you will have no appetite for the things of God. You will be okay like the animals, just to eat your fill and die. But there's hunger. There's hunger. That cannot be satisfied by the fruit of my labor. It's another hunger. Walking through the fields, he says, Do you not say, Though yet four months, then comes the harvest? I say, You're looking at the wrong harvest. Lift up your eyes. I want to show you a harvest that's already ripe. Destroy this temple, he says, And in two days, in three days, I will raise it up. Three days, <laughs> I will raise it up. Which temple was he talking about? The one that took 46 years to build? No, you're not that you are my mammals. You are my sacred dwelling place. <laughs> Your, your skinos, your tabernacle, your skin hosts, the most holy place, your being. God wants you to fall in love with your thoughts. You see, God, what does that? His thoughts entwine with my thoughts, and thoughts become flesh. Every time we eat a meal, we celebrate the incarnation. I mean, I love communion, but you know, every meal is a communion now. Amen. Because every time you eat and drink, you're celebrating the incarnation. Yeah. Food becomes flesh. You don't have to think, oh, I'm going to try, uh, this is going to be, you know, just, you <laughs> eat healthy, you know. <laughs> celebrate the incarnation. Thought becomes flesh. The incarnation is the key that unlocks the mystery. It's not Christ hiding somewhere in history or in outer space, but it's Christ in you. In that day you will know that as I'm in my Father, so you are in me. We're not left like orphans. We're not robbed of His presence. His presence is alive in you. Unfortunately, one of the errors that we've made in many of most of our translations, we've translated the word to be the second coming. Parousia, which means immediate presence. It's amazing how we're going to delay moments. You know, we've got to play for time. Do you not say there are four months, then comes the harvest? Always oh, the end times. You'll enjoy the whole chapter in our end times. And eschatology redefined eschatos. <laughs> Playing for time. <laughs> the hour is come yeah. for the Son of Man to be glorified. Yes. And all flesh shall see it together. <laughs> We're living in the most exciting days with the veil that is covered the minds of masses of humanity is unveiled. And people discover not a new church, a new doctrine, a new idea. They discover themselves unveiled in the face of their maker. Yes. In your neighbor. And in your neighbor. And in your wife. And in your children. And in people that would possibly irritate you. <laughs> <laughs> You discover no longer anyone according to the flesh. 
flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, Simon. I said, you were a bit close. So way back, I'm reading 1 Kings 6, and I'm struck with the sentence, verse 7. Not a sound of a hammer and a chisel. Not needed. Because something happened to the stone in the quarry. Isaiah 51, verse 1 says, You who pursue God, here's good advice. You who pursue righteousness. Oh, where do we go from here? He says, Look to the rock from which you were hewn, and the quarry from which you were dug. Simon, son of Jonah, I said to you, oh, Mr. Rock, by the way, the word kephas is the Aramaic for Petros, Greek, which is the same word, rock. That's the chip of the old block. So here I'm reading my next chapter, that day in October 1978, while we're reading 1 Peter 2. You know what he says? He says, like living stones, be yourselves built. Be yourselves built into a living sanctuary. My, my, my. Lydia's now moved to Peter Marisburg, where she did her third year in nursing. And I've just discovered that the foundation is done. And here I'm reading about like living stones. And we printed that on our wedding card. And some of you might have seen it on Facebook because that card was almost destroyed in our house. And the morning after the fire, at that time I was doing uh, lodge in the South of Sand, and we charge our own bullets, load your own bullets, and I had gunpowder and stuff in my, in my safe next to the bed, and everything exploded. It was a thatch roof house that we built ourselves, everything was just burned to rubble. And there where our bed was, I found a wedding car. Like the big stones to sell sport. You see, there's a storm-proof place. There's a fire-proof place. That you know I may engage in now permanently in him who is true. Who has given us a mind to know. That we are in him who is true. Listen to you, Simon, son of Jonah. I say you are Petros. And upon this Petra, I will build what we've now unfortunately translated to church. The word is ecclesia. We can still use the word church. I don't want to start a new language, but I just want to. What we do in the mirror, the philosophy in the mirror is very much. Digging up, digging up wonderful treasures. And the Greek words are mostly compound words. So the word ekklesia, it's actually, yeah, I'm to ekklesia. Two words, ek is the preposition. It always points to origin. Now remember, Jesus said, blessed are you Simon, son of Jonah. So he's giving him reference by his surname. Guess what the word Kaleo means? <laughs> to surname. Does this word perhaps hint <laughs> that humanity is about to discover the answer to their biggest quest? Who am I? Where do I fit into the scheme of things? What defines me? And the gates of Hades. You see, you're on a mission here. Thank you, my brother. <laughs> when you discover that what Jesus is all about, you simultaneously discover what you're all about. Because upon this rock, this Petros, I love it the way when Paul talks, because we, we so easily, you know, make of Petros, Peter, Patrick, or whatever, and we don't think of the meaning. 
So just to tell us about, then Paul speaks about kephas. It sounds completely different, but it says the same thing. Because it's all about the rock. What is the rock? Oh, St. Peter. No, no, no. It's about that revelation. It's about the mystery that was hidden for ages and generations. I love God's patience. For ages and generations, we lived under the wrong idea of who we are. We've borrowed ideas from our cultures, from our ethnic groupings, from our languages, from our geographies. We've borrowed these ideas. No wonder we were hostile and always in competition with one another. You know what this word does? It brings an end to war. Yeah. Because God has taken hostility out of the equation. Yeah. Ha <laughs> ha! Don't waste money on war, people of this world. Discover the good news. We live in a global age. <sighs> what a day to be alive, to be announced. I was going to go to Isaiah 40. I hope we could get some time in the weekend slot. You have all of good tidings. Get the open to a high mountain. Lift up your voice with strength. God wants us to discover that which gives us altitude. That which gives my life, which makes my whisper thunder. Yeah. What gives volume to your voice? Ecclesia. Do you know what? You know what God's mission is with your life? To plunder the gates yeah. of hell. Hades. Haides. Are you familiar with the word Hades? But most people are not familiar with the etymological components. Huh? It's a negative particle. It's negative. It is. It is. Is to see. So you might put ha with it is. It means not to see. The blindfold mode of the human race. Now, if the strategy of what God is revealing in sonship. And the answer to the question, who is man? Who am I the son of man? And discovering in Yeshua, Jesus, the Savior. What did He save me from? From the lies that I believed about myself. Yes. The word hamartia, we'll get into it maybe the rest of it. The word that we translated sin is to forget what, the, what, what manner of man you are. It's a confused, distorted identity. So the mission of the church is to announce that the gates... Now remember when you talk this language in those days, what was their security in the cities? Massive walls. Massive walls. I mean, some of those walls, you could run chariots on them. They were roads. The bigger the city, the bigger the walls, the, the bigger the threat to an enemy that might just come to sneak in on them. What were the most strategic places in that wall? The gates. If the enemy can take the gates, they can plunder the goods. Now let's just get the picture straight. Who's about to plunder who? Oh, you've got to watch out for the devil. Oh, well, that's what he made with him. So, no, 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 they've got it all wrong. The gates of Hades shall not be able to resist you. Massive, massive masses of nations are waiting for you to announce good news. To liberate their minds from the lies they believed about themselves. You're not defined by what you've got baked away or what you've got in lack or what you've got in this or in that. It's the wrong currency. That's what the book of Revelation is all about. Those currencies suddenly cannot buy anything. <laughs> Because it's a new mind that engages your thoughts with the thoughts of God. And come on, kicks in. Yeah. <sighs> and you mount up with wings like eagles. Suddenly you're not a trap. I mean, you're also in prison. But you think that prison cell defined his ministry? Not for one split second. He's speaking loud and clear right now. That's why I could write in Philippians 2, verse 12. He says, <laughs> Not only my presence much more in my absence. Do you know how your testament ministry is measured? 
not by Paul's next epistle, Paul's next visit, but by his message being more present in you right now than when Paul could ever be in his body. Jesus says, it's to your advantage that I go. Oh, Jesus, how can you do this to us? <laughs> the gates of Hades shall not prevail against you. Those mindsets that have kept humanity trapped in lies that they believed and sold for generations will not prevail against them. Ecclesia, the original identity redefined in you, packaged in you, in your being, you discover I am. And God is not embarrassed to make you His home, His address. So that you may know that just as Jesus is in the Father, so you are in, on the same level. You know, some inferior and God's so will sneak this one in too. No, 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 you are there fully embraced. And I'm in you. We can afford to pursue this knowledge. Hosea says it so beautifully. He says, let us press on to know. Speaks about the mystery of our co-inclusion in the resurrection of Jesus. Hosea 6 verse 2. The only scripture in the entire Old Testament that speaks of the third day resurrection includes you. After two days, he will revive us. Yeah. Says Hosea, 800 years BC. He says, on the third day, he will raise us up. Can you imagine how Paul goes into Jabula mode? He's sitting in prison. He goes, ah, and he shouts, he screams, and think about this, this guy's gone off his head. He did. He's like, in this. <laughs> he says, I will behave. He says, 2 Corinthians 5. He says, I will behave myself for your sakes. But then I'm on my own. I'm going to kill it. And he goes, <laughs> Can you kill it? When Jesus was raised, we were raised. They're going to. And you know, you'll see in the book of Revelation, there's a counter fraternity. This account of a lamb. It looks like a lamb that's got a dragon's voice. It's all wolf in sheep's clothing. Yeah. And there's even one of the heads that arise out of this ocean. And it gets slayed. It uses the same word for sacrifice. And it's not again, it lives again. You see, even the resurrection message can be a message straight from the beast if it does not include you. If, if Easter is all about celebrating an historic event, we're missing the point. We're not celebrating, oh, you know, oh Jesus, that's a shame, you know, he died, he was so cruelly crucified. I mean, that's wonderful. But, but you know, we missed the point in the message. And then you see, our face is there. I hope there. I, I think, Barabbas, Barabbas, remember that man was supposed to be crucified in Jesus' face? I'm sure he was the first man to get the revelation. Because he knew. That's my cross. That's me dying there. And in the grave the same. Yeah, Joseph and, 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 and Nicodemus. I mean, that time Nicodemus was old. Before he would sneak in at night, you know, to go ask the questions. And now him and this guy Joseph, they, they, they go and stalk to Pilate. They say, listen, the body on the cross. We want to take it down. And we're going for his grave. And guess which grave they chose? Joseph's grave. He died on another man's cross. And was buried in another man's grave. Yes. Yes. You're not of the rock. Yes. You're not of the rock. Yes. Look to the rock from which you are here. The resurrection of Jesus is your being rebooted into newness of life. Yes. Oh. Yes. Look to the rock from which you are here. And upon this rock, all the is Is the revelation of the resurrection. You are. We are. Resurrection generation. Yes. The old things have passed away. All they were wrote, behold, behold. That's psychology. We can entertain ourselves with horror stories for decades to come. It's not gospel. The Corinthians 5.17, Paul does not say, behold the old. He says, the old things have passed away. Why? Because in verse 14 he says, one has died for all yes. equals. Therefore, all have died. Yes. He says, therefore, <laughs> if any man be in Christ, we used to read, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. But Paul never wrote that. He says, therefore, if. 
Do you know what the therefore does to the if? It turns the question mark into an exclamation mark. It turns the condition into a conclusion. While we preach a gospel with conditions, we're not preaching the good news. The good news is not connected to some kind of condition. That will bring the same response. Oh, we bought from the Lord from a sinful man. You're equally included in his death and in his resurrection. We're pursuing this father with all our hearts. To see this clearly. Clearly to gaze deeply. Like James says, you know, he's the father of lights with whom there's no variables. No shadow left to change. God doesn't have a hidden agenda. He says, and in that, he says, he brought us forth. Again, in the grief. He gave birth to us through the word of truth, the incorruptible seed that we carry. Like you go to the desert when the rain comes, what happens? The desert blossoms. The seed's already in the soil, waiting for the rain. So shall my word be that comes from my mouth. It shall be calmed and prosper in my mission. In your skin. Oh, we have an exciting day. This is God's moment for you. The old things have passed away. Now that the hope comes. Just, Behold! Yes. All things have become new. Yes. Stop gossiping the past. Yes. Stop engaging the past. Yes. The old things are buried. Romans 6 verse 11 says, Reckon, look it so might. Come to a logical conclusion about your life. Reckon yourselves to have died together with Christ. The old things have passed away. Don't make the old things your gospel. Yeah. You'll have a large audience, but it's not the gospel. It's not good enough. Yeah. A lot of people like to skim the stories. Have you heard this about so much? Come on. Let's engage with the old. Everything has become new. Everything has become new. You can never, ever again look at yourself the old way. The old, I did not get mindset. You might knock on the door and say, no. I'm engaging with royalty. I'm engaging with mine. The throne room thoughts. Colossians 3, Paul says, If then we are raised together with Christ. And remember, remember what Paul means when he says if? Question, not question mark, exclamation mark. Because every good of they shall be made straight. Yeah. Yeah. Remember when, when, when uh, Paul had this encounter, struck off his horse? Where did he, what was the address? Very good will show him to go. Go to a road called Straight. <laughs> hey! Oh no, but we've got to have more. There are more questions than answers. Then you're listening to the wrong gospel. Come on! Don't let your questions confuse you. Jesus didn't come to add confusion. He came to conclude the answer of God. He says in Corinthians, he says, however many promises there are, he didn't know something. In God, in you, yes. God has made them all yes. yes. Not maybe. Yes. Not well, we'll have to wait and see. Discover God's yes. yes. And then what do we say? Amen. <laughs> Agree with God about you. Take sides with God. Because the one is wrong. <laughs> Don't waste money on trying to build another temple in Jerusalem. Please don't do that. <laughs> you have a temple. The days of the shadows are over. Don't get yourselves confused with geographic holy places. All the Samaritan lady says, but you Jews said that we should worship in Jerusalem. But we worship you with Jacob left us this world. Jesus says, they're both wrong. Let me just give it to you. John chapter 4. Verse what? Verse 23, 24. Let's <laughs> promise 21. Listen to this. Jesus said unto her, Believe me, lady, the moment everyone was waiting for has come. <laughs> oh, we are living in the last days. <laughs> From now on, Worship is no longer about a geographic holy mountain yeah. or a sacred city in Israel experience. Oh, 
and those do us so well. Yes. It's not, um, in my commentary, you know, I say, it's not whether you are a Jew in Jerusalem or a Gentile in Japan. The days of prophetic pictures are over. Yes, amen. And I've written a beautiful thing on prophecy, 1 Corinthians 12 or 14, I can't keep which you will really enjoy. I'm not negating it, it's wonderful. I mean, Agabus stood up and said, this is going to be the famine. But the prophetic ministry under the new covenant is always for edification. Yes. Yes. It's always yes. to yes. release something. Yes. So the strategy was released. So that these Jewish practical believers had a knock on their door and the, the Gentile believers would say, these guys are not part of the promises. How could they be part of the family now? Yeah. They came with food parcels from the Jews were hungry. Yeah. You see, it's a good strategy. The Holy Spirit is wonderful. <laughs> Verse 22. You have been worshipping in ignorance all along, while the Jews continue to anticipate the Messiah in their devotion, he says to the Samaritan woman. Knowing that the prom promise pointing to the Savior of the world would be emerging from within. And I said to you, oh. said the Samaritans, I know they were a mixed race and only received the five books of Moses while they rejected the prophets. 2 Kings 17, 28 to 30. Then verse 23, the end of an era has arrived. The future is here. Whatever prophetic values were expressed in external devotional forms and rituals are now eclipsed in true spirit worship from within. Face to face cross with the Father, acknowledging our genesis in Him. This is his delight. The Father's desire is to worship the more than the worship. He yeah. rediscovered us in your ear, it's a new domain. Yeah. Living from within. Yes. Living from within. Yes. Thank you, Father. Yes. Where are we with our time? Can we have taken a little break now? Are you guys okay for a little break? Just hang on before you go. Thank you, my precious Lord. Oh. Isn't it wonderful, man? The distance is cancelled. Yes, yes. Every definition of it, just like the rain and the snow come down from heaven. And heaven's language becomes very, very much mother tongue language. Living epistles known and read by all. Your life speaks a universal language. Doesn't matter where you go. In your awareness, in your living overwhelmed to the awareness of who I am yes. and what God's vision is within me yes. to find voice, to find face, feet, hands, hear his body, hear his body. Yes. He's so present right now in you and he's just asking for the nations. That's Psalm 2. Remember the previous verse, Psalm 2 says, Today, I have begotten you. Paul preaches this when he preaches the resurrection in Acts 13. He quotes Psalm 2. Paul's message was the resurrection. Come on, we are rebooted into newness of life. The default settings <laughs> fell on voice again. Absolutely. Here we are. Discover ourselves in you. Members of life, the Bible goes Psalm 2. He says, Today I have begotten you. You are God begotten in heaven, in the resurrection. And now the next sentence says, So what do I do with this? There's only one thing that will feed your appetite. He says, Give me the nations. And he says, I've given you the heads of the earth. Lord, give us the nations. The Muslim nations, the Catholic nations, the Hindu nations, give us the nations. Then yeah. yeah. I arrived in Elizabeth, our son won a piano competition in the previous years, so we invited. Never been to, to Portugal before, and as we landed, we walked to the building, I said to them, let's ask him for the Portuguese speaking nations. He said, God, we ask him for Angola, for those who have been, for Brazil. Portugal. And as we did that, I get a, a text message from Shelton, Miguel, he, he translates the Shona version in Harare. He's got no idea where we are. And I'm on roaming, so I get a text message. 
and tell them, says, Francois, you've asked God for the nations. God says, I've given you the nations. And he was telling me this morning, he said, we give you the other one. Live the adventure. Live the adventure. Thank you, Father. Yeah, and they say, my goodness, it's a feast. <laughs> Love you. 